So again, here are some of the zip line courses uh, that are there. We want to encourage you guys to come out. It's totally worth going to, taking a family trip. Uh, the Creation Museum is, uh, has actually been visited now by over 2 million people since opening in 2007. It is, it is just top notch. Every time people go through there, they say, gosh, it's so well done. Well, guess what? Our vice president of design there was the senior director at Universal Studios, and he was the one that designed Jaws and King Kong uh, before they turned it into a 3D um, experience. And so there at the Creation Museum, there is also a, a beautiful introduction into the Garden of Eden. And there we have Adam. And notice that we have uh, uh, Adam there at a mild or mid-tone uh, 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 shade or tone um, in his body. And I'm going to get ta t talk to you about that in more detail. But we have Adam and Eve there. We know that in the beginning God created the man, male, and female. He did not create the male and male. If so, none of us would be here today. Male and female, he created them. The Bible says something tragic happened. And this total tragedy that happened was that through one man, through a perfect man, catch that. How many people have said, man, Adam was so dumb. You know, if I was Adam, I would have never done that. Has anybody ever thought that before? Well, catch this. He was perfect. But through this perfect man, he was tempted, we know. Sin entered the entire world. And death through sin, that's why all of us will one day die. In 50 to 70 years from now, everybody that's sitting here in this room will no longer be physically. The Bible also says this. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth. You see, that when Adam sinned, he transferred death not only to the human race. There are not many races of people. There's one human race because we all go back to Adam and Eve. But his sin also infected and affected all of creation. And creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth. And the Bible says we ourselves groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship or daughtership, the redemption of our bodies. You see, guess what? Most of us are, are young. Some are younger than, than me. Some of us don't feel young. The reality is, is that we're all dying. Slowly, we are all dying because of the effects of sin. The rebellion that Adam and Eve initiated, our blood system has been tainted, and therefore, naturally, our flesh wants to rebel against God. And so all of creation dies. Trees die. Dogs die. Everything dies. And we see that. Thankfully, it was there in the Garden of Eden that God said, Adam, Eve, I don't want you to die spiritually. And so God gave them the first example of a sacrifice, that one day there would be a perfect sacrifice for them through his son. But it was there that God covered them. God showed them the first animal sacrifice, and they saw the tragedy of their sin. Methuselah is in our creation museum. Does anybody know how old he was when he died? Say it out loud. Come on. Wow, these guys read their Bible. That's good. That's good. Methuselah, we have him there. Old guy. I'm sure he was hoping that, you know, he could stay young forever. But guess what? We all will die. And there we have Methuselah, who is the grandfather of Noah. And there in the creation museum... We also have, I'm going to get back to our scripture, there inside 1% of the volume of Noah's Ark. And so we have pictures there of, of, uh, of um, the Ark being constructed. It's interesting because after Adam and Eve rebelled against God, remember they wanted to become God themselves. They wanted to be equal to him. They wanted to be like him. It's interesting that about a thousand years after that horrific incident, you would think that we would learn our lesson the first time. But about a thousand years later, the Bible tells us here in Genesis 
chapter 6. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Some translations say that they were able to accomplish, to think up all of these imaginations and fulfill these imaginations of evil, of violence. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race. And I just got to stop there because this is a totally different topic and a different uh, uh, um, uh, talk that I give on the human race. But I want you to, young people, please, and I urge you that when people say what race you are, you tell them that you're from the human race. There is no white race. There is no black race. There is no uh, Mexican race. There is no Arabic race because that's an evolutionary idea that came from evolution stating that because you have darker skin, you evolved later on and therefore do not have an intellect equal to that person who is lighter and vice versa. We come from the human race because we come, all come from Adam and Eve. And if there's somebody that agrees with me, can I hear an amen in the house? Amen. And so what we see here is that things got so evil about a thousand years after Adam and God says, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I've created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground. Now let me just stop right there. The fact that God put up with so much evil for about a thousand years shows you how loving and how graceful God is. So when you read the Old Testament, when your peers and your uh, friends in school say, oh, look at the Old Testament, God is just always angry. God is always, you know, wanting to murder people. He's always wanting to, you know, swallow them up and damn them to hell. Say, hey, time out. You're not reading your Bible correctly. God always gives an opportunity to repent, to turn from sin. And even though that the time of Noah was so evil and so wicked, Noah, the Bible says, was a righteous man. What does that mean? He stood for what was right. He stood on the truth of God's word, despite the majority of the people, despite the entire culture saying, hey, you know what? What you believe in, in this Bible right here, those are a bunch of fairy tales. You should be like us. You should accept us. You should, you know, participate in what we do. But the Bible says that he was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. He found favor, this man named Noah. And so God instructed Noah to build an ark. Why was this ark needed? Well, catch this. We see that God was going to send a massive flood upon the entire earth, but God will never exercise his judgment on the righteous, meaning that his wrath, if the world is evil and you're following the Lord, God's wrath is not going to come upon you. He will make an ark of salvation to protect you from such wrath. The ark is a symbol of Jesus Christ. The ark of salvation. How interesting that it was from a tree in the garden that cursed Adam and Eve. It was also that this ark was made out of trees to save Noah and his family. And thousands of years later, there would be another tree that Jesus would be hanging from. And he would be nailed to, to pay off that penalty of our first parents. You see how all that kind of connects right there? And so Noah's Ark, we have uh, uh, animatronic uh, uh, um, animals and dinosaurs, and also we have Noah, and you could ask him questions there uh, at the Creation Museum. But I want to show you this picture. It is, it is a picture of what they do to buildings when they wanted to knock them down back in the old days. Nowadays, they explode them with dynamite and what have you. But here we see how they would 
pound at the foundation of a building in order for it to crumble. There are several things that I see in our culture today that try to pound at the foundation of God's word, and it's always at Genesis. They always say, how can you believe in the Bible if dinosaurs were here, you know, millions of years ago? How can you believe in the Bible if we had evolved from uh, apes? How can you believe in the Bible if Noah's Ark is just a fairy tale? Aren't these the pictures that the world sees? In fact, it's sad to say, but in many of our churches, we have this painted up in our churches. And I would agree with the world. How can you believe in Noah's Ark if this is all you're being shown even at your own church? But guess what? When we read God's word, we note that this was a massive ship. In fact, God gave Noah the exact measurements to build this massive ship. And yes, it would have floated on water. Guess what? The proportions of all modern day ships, the same proportions that all modern day ships use, guess what? They use the same measurements or proportions as given from God to Noah. So guess what? If your Bible was a fairy tale and God was a fake and this was written just by some guy, you would think that the measurements would be off a little bit, wouldn't you think? But they're to exact detail. In fact, this ark was so massive that the ark was, if you compared it to a football field, it is about a football field and a half long. A cubit was standardized several times. When you read the word cubit, um, it was um, meant to be measured from the elbow to the tips of the finger. But guess what? Some of you guys have longer uh, forearms than I do. Some of you guys have shorter forearms than I do. And so it was standardized at different times. And the measurement um, roughly starts at around eight, uh, 18 inches all the way up to about 21, 22 inches long. In fact, the ark that we're rebuilding, we're using the old Egyptian cubit, which is uh, roughly uh, 21 inches long. So the ark that we are building is going to be some 510 feet long. Massive ship. And there's a little picture that we have uh, here that uh, it's under construction now. And here's uh, just a little view for you to just show you kind of just uh, the depth of the ark size that we're uh, building up there in Kentucky. I want us to refocus back to what I was mentioning at the very beginning of our session. You either have man's word or you have God's word. There's no in-between. You see, we have two guys here on my slide. They both have glasses on. And whatever type of glasses you put on or lenses... From those lenses, you will then interpret everything you see. If you put on foggy glasses right now, and we were to do that ex uh, exercise, everything I would see would always look kind of fuzzy. If I put on glasses that I could see clearly, guess what? I will be able to see clearly the colors and the shades and so on and so on. According to God's word. You have only two religions or two words. You see, once you take off the lenses of using God's word to see the world, then you start beginning to interpret the world through what some guy has to say or what some guy believes in. And this is why I want to encourage you, young people, old people, you know, moms, dads, whoever you are here, that when you're going to see something, do you first filter it through God's word? That's the question. You see, here at the Creation Museum, we have this dig site. And we have two scientists, two archaeologists, and they're, they're digging up the same fossilized bones of a dinosaur. And when you go there to the Creation Museum, 
one archaeologist is saying, hmm, this dinosaur must be 65 million years old. And it must have been uh, laying here after a local flood. But do you see, those are his beliefs. But the other scientist is saying, wow, this is one of the fossils of a destroyed dinosaur after the flood. It was quickly fossilized. It was covered by dirt, by sand and water quickly and laid down in rock layers because of the flood. You see how they have two different viewpoints. And on that matter, I want you to understand this. Whenever you dig up some dinosaur bones, the dinosaur bones doesn't have a, a, a name tag and says, hey, I'm Lucy and I'm 65 million years old. That is just somebody's idea. And so we base our thinking in every area on God's word. When it comes to marriage, on God's word. On raising our kids, God's word. When it comes to making friends and the type of friends we're supposed to make, God's word. When we see the destruction and when we see things in our world and we see how the earth has been marred, we say, how is this so? Well, guess what? First, we filter it through God's word. And so 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be ready to give a defense or apologia to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Last year, I had the privilege of teaching a semester here at the Bible College. And there was this gal that was in my class, and man, she was asking me question after question after question. And I was like, man, does she not like me? Because the way it was coming across was very hostile. And I said, what did I do to her? I mean, is she just not like guys, or what's the deal here, you know? And at the end of the semester, after going through God's word and answering every question that she brought up, I received a letter from her. And her letter said something like this. Dear Andy, and it was not a love letter, okay, so I just want to let you know that. She said, at the beginning of the semester, I was about to drop out of Bible college. My friends, who are atheists, kept on bombarding me with questions, and I had no answers from God's word. She said, it got to the point that I became so doubtful of God's word that I feared that I was not even saved at all. But she said, now that I have the answers, now that I have the answers, I am no longer afraid, and I believe in God's word. So, yeah, praise God. Give it up to the Lord. So here was the big question. Where were all, uh, uh, where all the animals on the ark? That's the question. Were they? The Bible says in Genesis 6, 19, and, on every li and every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark. Guess what? In the Hebrew, it means every kind. <laughs> so are you trying to tell me that the dinosaurs are in the ark? Yes. In fact, on day six, if you read your Bibles, we see in chapter one that on day six that God created the cattle, but the Bible also says that he created all land-dwelling animals, every beast of the earth. And later on, that same day, he created man and woman. And so, we're going to be talking more in detail about this. But then God re-emphasizes himself. It's like God repeats himself over and over. It's like your parents when they repeat themselves. Go clean your room, go clean your room, go clean your room, go clean your room, right? Why do they keep on telling you to go clean your room, right? Because you forget or you ignore them, right? And God knows that we're that way. So he repeats himself over and over and over and over and over again. Like, you know, hello, wake up, right? On the very same day, Noah's wife and uh, his sons... And their wives entered the ark. They and every beast, every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind. I mean, it's like, wow, a kind, kind, kind. kind. Okay, Lord, I get it. Male and female of all flesh went in as God had commanded him, 
And then the Bible says that Noah did not shut the, the, the door, but the Lord shut him in. And so when we see this ark, and you say, gosh, how did all the animals get into there? The question is, and we're going to the question is this. Why was it so empty? That should be the question. I'm going to tell you why in a little bit. This word for kind does not focus in at the species level. And we see that in Genesis chapter 1, it's, it's, it's repeated 10 times. But we know that there's the Animalia kingdom, the phylum class, order, family, genus, species. We would look at that word kind more at the family level. At the family level. You have the cat kind. You have the dog kind. They're separate kinds of family animals. And by the way, as a side note, if you believe in evolution, that everything came out of one tree, if you would, you would expect that a cat could breed with a dog. But they can't do that. You know why? Because each animal is their own orchard that God created. They're their own kind. So we have the dog kind, the canine family, the cat kind. And there are some um, categories of order, which uh, the elephants have their order. But at the end of the day, primarily, we're talking about the family kind. A secular book written by secular people, scientists, called The Molecular Evolution of the Dog Family. Molecular Evolution of the Dog Family. They state the dog family is a diverse group of 34 species ranging in size and proportion. They go on to say this, which is a little contradictory. It is clear that the domestic dog originates from the wolf. So the fact that there is variation within the dog kind, they see that as evolution. But evolution states that there is an increase of change and you have animals becoming other animals. So, we have many dogs. We got foxes, we got black jackals, we have uh, uh, Africa, uh, African uh, uh, wild dogs, we have uh, foxes and what have you. Many variations of dogs. But if I ask you the, this question, we have the wolf, we have the coyote, we have the fox. At the end of the day, what are they? Wolves. Catch this. You can get a wolf and you can mate it with a domestic dog. You can get a fox and, and mate it with a domestic dog because they're all dogs. They're all dogs. You have Dalmatians, you have greyhounds, you have beagles and what have you. So from the wolf, if you had the maximum amount of DNA information in there for the variety of different looking dogs, you would expect to have different dogs coming out of, say, the first two wolves. And you would have something coming from the wolf to even this, the poodle. I'm not, it's barely a dog, but it's a dog. You get the point here, right? Here's the question. Does the poodle have the maximum amount of variety in it, or has it lost information? It's lost information. Evolution is that it has gained information, that it has improved. It, has this improved the wolf? <laughs> so we have the dog kind. So you see that it's all downhill from after the wolf. You see that? You got the wolf, coyote, dingo, collie, and then something that looks like a dog called a poodle. And so you see that what Noah needed on the ark during or right before the flood was only two dogs with the maximum amount of information. Let me get into this. Again, why do we have extinction? Well, because after the flood, a lot of the habitat 
that was uh, on this earth was destroyed. You have death and violence. You also have how sin is affecting creation. And so by natural selection, we believe in natural selection, you know, that um, if you are uh, in the jungle and you um, don't have a means of protecting yourself, well, you're going to die. And you get extinct that way. Evolution says that we are on an uphill trend. But everything that we observe, which is using the scientific method, what you observe is that we're on a downward trend. You know how I know that? Not only because we die, but we're dying earlier. In fact, I have little cousins that when they're two months old, they found cancer in their body. You see the effects of sin is spreading throughout all of creation. It's getting worse. We're not evolving to become better. And so again, here's just a quick science exercise about the amount of variation. If you have the two um, uh, uh, dogs original dogs with a maximum amount of information here, you would expect for there to be a variety within that kind, and that's exactly what we see. And so when the first two wolves or dogs came out of the ark, they had kids, and their kids had kids, and their kids had kids, and their kids had kids, and guess what? You have lots of dogs. In fact, some dog... So, uh, today we even see, we even see um, uh, some dogs have up to you know, 10 to 12 babies. Now, could you imagine the reproduction of, of many dogs coming together quickly? Now, they spread throughout the whole earth, each with their own information. But as you spread out, you have less information within that species. I want you to see this. If you have two medium-haired dogs and they fall in love, we know that their genetics has some dominant genes and some recessive genes. So they fall in love, they get married at the Bible college, <laughs> and they say, it's time to have babies. So because of their genetic makeup, you will expect for them to have variety within their family. So you have a short hair, you'll have a medium haired dog, you'll have a long haired dog. Now, these dogs say, I loved it here for the first 18 years of my life, it's time to take off, and I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to go to a cold climate. I'm going to go live in uh, the North Pole or Michigan, which is kind of like the North Pole, right? It's really cold up there. Now, because we have this variation now migrating out to different climates, you would expect for some things to happen. The short-haired dog, the uh, medium-haired dog, and the long-haired dog will definitely adapt differently or not adapt to their new environment. So, the first two dogs, they didn't have enough money to build a house and uh, put a chimney up, so they died. Okay? So what would you expect for there to be as a dominant dog surviving? The long-haired dog. You get that? But they all originate back to their first parents that came, out, came off of the ark. The same thing that would happen is if you have the long-haired dog, the long-haired dog finds another long-haired dog, they have dominant genes, they have recessive genes, they get married, they get married, you know, at, at, um, at their church, and uh, they said, hey, you know what, their kids have kids, and their kids say, hey, it's time to get out of the house, um, I like my, my room being messy and I don't want my parents talking to me and telling me how to clean my room anymore. So they take off and they go out to, uh, to Palm Springs. And so they go to Palm Springs. There's the long-haired dog, the medium-haired dog, and the, and the dog that doesn't have any hair. Well, sadly, some of these dogs didn't have enough money to uh, buy an air conditioning unit. And what do you expect to happen? They get uh, thirsty and they died. So what's going to be the dominant 
the dominant dog there. Well, the dog who doesn't have all that hair. Okay? But does this mean that, oh, this is a brand new evolutionary dog here that is, um, is a different kind of animal? No, at the end of the day, it's a dog. So I want to make sure we get it all that clear, okay? And so he survived. So we talked about this natural selection and evolution, um, how we are going downwards. Within the variation of the dogs, you can see here the different sizes of their um, craniums and what have you, but at the end of the day, they're dogs. Now, I, I move on to this right here because the Bible says that every kind or family kind of bird was on the ark. Darwin, when he saw these finches with different sized beaks, he says, oh, there must be evolution. And so guess what? He, he wrote, he drew a tree. And he says, everything must have started. No, he said, I think everything started this way. So he started with palm scum and then everything kind of branching out and evolving into their own uh, anim animal kingdoms and what have you. But at the end of the day, what he didn't realize was that these were birds and they would always be birds. So God only needed two of every kind, family kind of animal, just like God said. Now, we have the two foundations. Man's word, which is the tree of life. God's word, he created orchards of different animals. You can't crisscross them. So as we get back to the ark, the most conservative estimates of the family kinds needed the land-dwelling animals to repopulate the entire earth is as little as 2,000 up to 16,000 family kinds of animals or two, two pairs of each or a pair of each. What does this mean? Very interesting. Because when we go back to looking at the ark, based on that amount of animals needed on the ark, this would mean that there was over 1.5 million cubits of free space on the ark. You see, the average size of a dinosaur, the average size, not the uh, not the size of every dinosaur, but the average size of the dinosaur was the size of a sheep. And knowing that helps you understand that God could have brought on very young dinosaurs onto the ark, hibernated them, even brought on eggs on the ark. And so when you put all this into perspective, understanding that the ark was massive and so big, the question really is, why did God create an ark so big, so massive, to have so much empty space? Think about that. Here's the answer. God says that he is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he's patient, he's long-suffering towards us not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. You see, in 2 Peter 2, 5, the Bible says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So Noah, understanding that this ark was so massive and so big and has so much free space, because all he needed was two of every kind of animal, land-dwelling animal. He did not need the fish on the ark. The fish already were in the water. They did not need to be in the, in the ark. It is not far-fetched to believe that Noah was saying, come on to the ark of salvation. God wants to save you from your sins. But sadly, they rejected him. So what are the best evidences of the global flood? I'll tell you what, it's the Grand Canyon. People go to the Grand Canyon, and the park rangers, when you go there, they'll say, hey, look at what a little bit of water has done. And millions of years. That's what they'll tell you. It carved out this entire canyon. And that's what they'll say. A long amount of time 
and a little bit of water. But if your lenses start with God's word and you filter what you see with God's word, everything makes sense. We believe there's a lot of water and a little bit of time. That's why we have the Grand Canyon. You see, because of the flood, you would expect it to moisten the ground. You would expect for there to be tons of water molding and bending sandstone. And this is what you see. You see how it's bent right there on that picture? That could only happen as if the soil was moist. But if you believe in evolution, they will tell you that each strata represents millions of years of time stacked on top of each other. But just looking at that picture, how can that be if you have the strata going this way? And so we see that as one evidence. Here's another picture to show you more evidences of that. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 17, the Bible says this, the waters increased and they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth. And the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth and all high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. Did you catch that? The highest mountains were covered with water. So when somebody tells you, oh man, that's a, that was a local flood. Have you ever seen a local flood look like that? Where the water says, oh, I'm just going to stop right here. God's word, what does he say in his word? That he covered the entire surface of the earth and all the high mountains. Back there, I want to show you something. We're going to get a video ready here on the flood initiation. And the reason why this is so important is because people say, yeah, um, how, how can rain water coming down on the earth flood the whole earth? Come on, man, that doesn't make any sense. Well, I want you to see something. I'm going to see if I can pop it up on my, uh, on my computer here. The Bible says this in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. On that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. So guess what? There's rain coming from above and rain coming from below. What? what? I, I, I don't get that. Well, I want you to see this next video. Can you guys prep that initiation uh, video? And I want you to see this in living color. I was able to get a, a video from Noah. Uh, but, uh, he left me a video I want to share with you guys. So can you guys put that up there? i got pulling it up right now. Let's see here. And if you guys can't do it, just tell me. And I'll... All right, there you go.
amazing, isn't it? Yeah, praise God. It's a sad but honest testimony of God's word being true. I remind you, God for a thousand years was so gracious to the people, but they wouldn't listen. And God's word tells us, as we read earlier, here in Genesis chapter 7, that the water came from underneath the earth, the great deep. For thousands of years, people have mocked at this and said, that's impossible. But think about it. A lot of the water that we get, the drinking water, especially for those of us who live here in the desert area, we get it from well water, from underneath the ground. Did you know that? Now check this out. For thousands of years, people have mocked God's word. and said, oh, those are just fairy tales. But here, on a secular scientific website called Extreme Tech, scientists recently discovered an ocean 400 miles beneath our own feet that could fill our oceans three times over. So you see, God's word has always been true. And young person, you can forever trust God's word because he is not a liar. His word is truth. His word is so true that it can transform the person who reads his word. Is there a witness in the house of God? Amen. Now, during this time, we know that for the flood to happen, we saw there in God's word that the fountain deeps ruptured open. But for that to happen, there must have been an earthquake so massive that it would trigger for the, for the ocean to open up like that at such a magnitude. When those things happen, when earthquakes happen, you get a massive tsunami. And in areas where there are volcanoes, Earthquakes trigger volcanoes to actually erupt. When you mix in water with hot lava, you get very hot mud sand that travels quickly. And you know what it does? It carves out canyons. So when you go to the Grand Canyon, remember that is a testimony of the flood that happened some 4,300 years ago. In fact, in 1980, I was about three years old, there was an eruption there in Mount St. Helens. And there in Mount St. Helens, when it erupted, the heat, the, the hot mud that was going downstream carved these massive canyons, not in millions of years, but in just days, hours. Look at that. Now, I want you guys to see this one last video here.